Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our course, uh, a, uh, Deep Learning for um, Art, Aesthetics, and Creativity. Today, it is our uh, pleasure to have very a special speaker, David Bao. And um, I just let him to uh, introduce him a little more because I think it's very inspiring for uh, many students, uh, the path that he uh, has come to this point and for future. Please uh, go ahead, David. So I was, I, I want to uh, give a little background since I am um, a, 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 a post uh, industry academic. I spent a bunch of years as a software engineer uh, at Google before coming back to MIT. And I want to look, give a little bit of uh, insight in, in, in my thinking there. Um, so. You know, the reason it's really interesting to be in computer science right now is because the field is changing. Uh, the dream of having self-programmed computers is one of the oldest dreams in computer science, but it's never been a reality. Uh, even though we've studied machine learning for a long time, um, I think that until just a few years ago, machine learning was really more accurately called, it would have been more accurately called the art of accurate counting. <laughs> you know, statistics, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding the statistics of, uh, you know, how frequent words are and bigrams or, uh, you know, certain image statistics or something like that. And, and, uh, and if you, if you understand statistics well, then, 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 um, then, you know, you could do some nice tricks. But I think that um, uh, until recently, really calling these things, uh, sort of self-programmed systems uh, would have been an overstatement. But I don't think it's really an overstatement anymore. I think that these uh, machine learning models are really learning non-trivial things. And it leads to all sorts of questions about you know, what should we be doing as programmers? Um, what does it mean to do software engineering? And so I thought it was a very interesting time to come back uh, to academia. Uh, and th that's that's why I'm here. And I, and I actually think that that's one of the um, uh, choices you face when you're trying to decide between industry and academia. And I think in industry, uh, you will um, uh, have lots of resources to make things work, um, to make the next widget or the application. Um, and you know, there are great places, Google is a great place, where you can really push state of the art in that and do really neat stuff. Um, uh, I think that there's less of a push in industry to ask the question, why? Um, uh, you know, why do things work? Why are we doing what we're doing? Where, where is it going to lead in yeah, there are unintended consequences and things like that? You know, we, we, we tend not to ask those questions too much in industry because there's so much emphasis on, you know, the how, of how, to, how to get it to work. And so, um, and so, uh, so I, I, I thought it was a time to, um, to switch tracks and at, start asking why, because the field is changing so dramatically. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, I'd encourage people who have an interest in these type of questions uh, to, th to, to realize you can really make a, a real contribution on uh, taking the academic track uh, as well. So, okay, so let me um, uh, introduce my talk. So it's about uh, painting with neurons of general adversarial networks. It, it, it comes out of work uh, from asking why, um, you know, why do these uh, uh, networks do what they do? Um, and so, um, so let me uh, let me advance here. Am I in full screen? So do you see the uh, do you see the like the full screen slideshow? I can't see what I'm yeah. projecting, or do you see like all my notes and all that stuff? Yeah, I can see it, uh, but also maybe a student can tell us. Yeah, we can. Is, is everything looking yeah, good? Okay, yeah, it's a full screen slide. Hopefully, it's okay. So, so okay. So the main problem that uh, we're looking at here, and I'm not sure why the um, the images are overlapped in the right way. Hopefully the, the layout will uh, get fixed as we go on to next slides. But the, 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 the main problem surrounding my talk is image generation. And so uh, for the last few years, there's been this question, how do you make a state-of-the-art program to generate realistic images? And you know, the general process is first, you want to collect a data set of real images like these pictures of buildings uh, on the right. And um, and then you want to uh, 
uh, you know, train some sort of program, some sort of uh, generator network to generate uh, those programs. And so, so, you know, it's been a puzzle. There's a lot of different ways you could imagine doing this. And so, we, you know, people have been puzzling, how do you train such a thing? How do you even supervise it? You know, what should the, what should the inputs and the outputs of the network be? And, uh, and, and the thing that has really been working the best in recent years is, uh, you know, an architecture you guys have all heard of uh, called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And the trick for GANs is to reduce it down to a simpler problem that we know what we're doing. And so the simpler problem that they recognized when um, designing GANs was that generating images, we don't really know how to do, but classifying images, gosh, that is an easy problem. We can classify images. Um, and so, uh, so what we could do is we could train a classifier on this really easy task, which is given two sets of pixels, uh, which image is real and which image is not a real photograph. And it turns out that um, for most arrangements of pixels, this is a very easy uh, task to train a discriminator on. It gets very good, uh, you know, very quickly, we'll start getting 100% accurately uh, on that. And so, so, but the neat thing is that once we have a discriminator that can tell the difference between a fake image and a real image, then we can hook it up to our generator and we can say, all right, we didn't know how to tell you, generator, uh, how to make a real image, but you know what this discriminator can tell you because all you have to do is generate patterns of pixels that fool the discriminator. If you can make the discriminator think it's real, then it must be better than random. Um, now, the problem is that um, even though the discriminator can get very accurate at telling what's real, uh, the, um, the generator will also be very good at learning how to fool the discriminator without working very hard. It, it'll realize that, aha, the only thing I need to do to make the discriminator think it's real is put some blue sky in there and put some texture that kind of looks like, you know, building texture. And, and the discriminator will say, whoa, that totally looks real. There's a sky, you know, there's, there, there's the, right, like, the right colors for buildings and some, some vertical lines and things. Ah, that's totally real. But as a human, we look at that and we think, oh, that's not a very realistic image at all. So the trick is to iterate this process, to go back and forth. After the generator can generate sort of halfway looking real images, then uh, have the discriminator say, ah, well, that's actually fake. And we're gonna tell the difference between those new fakes, those better fakes and actual real photographs. And the discriminator has to now work harder at getting better. And so if you, if you alternate these processes, then, uh, then you end up very, get converging to very, very good generators that can generate very realistic images. Um, and they, uh, you know, the, the, the typical um, uh, learning process is actually just to do only one step of iteration uh, between the discriminator and generator and just alternate that. So by the time you're done, you've played this game, you know, millions and millions of times back and forth between the generator and the discriminator. But the neat thing that's happening here is that it can generate these images that look very realistic in the end. Um, but, uh, uh, Let's see, so, oh, here's another picture. So you, you, we'll, we'll get this, the, the images out that look very realistic in the end, and we'll get this generator, which is just this deterministic function that takes actually the, the input of the generator is actually just a random vector. Um, so we'll take these relatively small random vectors, like a 512 dimensional random vector, and we'll put it into this thing, and it's been trained so that no matter what it outputs, it will look very realistic, like this example image here. Or if I change a vector, I'll get a different image out and it will again look very realistic, even if it looks completely different. And so it's just a deterministic function that really wants to make realistic images. And, um, and so here's like a sample of like uh, output from a generator. And you can see that after millions of these uh, sort of generative uh, training steps uh, where it's pitted against a discriminator, it actually gets to be pretty good. Um, and so this is a StyleGAN V2. Uh, it's a model that was published last year. And um, and it's uh, uh, you know, currently the state of the art in generating uh, realistic images uh, of certain uh, certain types of uh, image distributions, uh, and and so when when you look at a collection of images like this, you might think, um, actually, the first time I looked at the output of some of these state of the art GANs, uh, I I was confused between the training set and the generated output. This is not the training set. This is actually what the generator is producing. Um, and so, uh, so you see all sorts of interesting effects here. Um, and so the, the, one of the questions to ask is, 
um, what the heck is the model doing inside? Can we understand the underlying algorithm and what the characteristics of that algorithm uh, is? Like, why does this work? Um, and so one of the funny things that you'll notice is that some of the images have these strange artifacts. Like, take a look at this one here. Um, so this, this GAN is pretty good. It's this generator. Um, is so good that it actually has noticed that the um, training distribution that it is imitating has some percentage of images that were stolen off of uh, Shutterstock, uh, and they still have the watermark on them. And and it, and 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 the generator says, well, I, if I want to make things look realistic, I better uh, put watermarks on some percentage of my images too. I, I, the, it it learns it's got to protect its own copyright. Uh, so, so it it does that, and so something like um, uh, six percent of the outputted images uh, from uh, state of the art style GAN will have these kind of artifacts that um, uh, show the same type of watermarks that were on the training set. Uh, this is the Elson Church training set, um, and so uh, so yeah, these kind of watermarks look like this. But the the reason I thought this was cool was that it. It, it's this very clear thing that the um, image generator does, but it doesn't always do it. Like most of the time when it generates images, uh, it generates images without a watermark, but sometimes you get these watermarks. And so um, and so it's, it's almost like this binary decision. Uh, there, it's like there must be a switch um, that the network has at some point where it decides whether it's gonna put a watermark on an image or not. And so we can kind of ask the question, where's that switch? Is there a neuron somewhere in this network, which is, which is uh, controlling the watermarkness? And so, uh, so I, I went on a hunt for this. Uh, this. This particular network has about 30 million parameters, which sounds like a lot, but it's just a deterministic computer program in the end. And, uh, and it's not that hard to go hunting for things like this. You just, you can make an algorithm that um, has a heuristic that determines whether it's a watermark or not, and just go hunting for, uh, for things that correlate with that. And so I'll, I'll show you what I, I found. Uh, so at layer five, I found this very interesting neuron that did um, uh, correlate with watermarks a lot. It was activating um, whenever images look like this in the end. And, and not only that, but because it's at layer five, it has a... Um, uh, has a location for where in the image it activates, and I'll show you where where it's activating. So, uh, so this neuron is activating, you know, at these middle parts of images whenever the image is showing a watermark. And there are other neurons that have similar behavior. Like, so for example, there's this neuron um, 234 at the same layer, and it activates in regions like this, both in the middle watermark and the bottom bar uh, that shows up. And there's about if you hunt through the neural network, you, you find about 30 neurons uh, that are similar uh, and behave like this. And so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so then the question is, well, do these things really act like a switch? What if we remove these neurons from the network? What if we force them all off? What if we, turn the, what if we force these neurons to be off all the time? Then what will happen? Um, so normally we think of these neural networks as completely opaque systems. Um, we train them end to end, they're just, you know, these big black box functions. And we normally think of the functions as computing things where everything depends on everything. And so if you randomly rip through the function and remove some of its uh, operations, then you, 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 maybe you'd expect to get total nonsense out, just garbage or noise. Uh, but we found these particular neurons that really correlate to this thing. So let's see what happens when we turn them off, do we get anything intelligible at all? So this is what the network generated uh, before. These are the uh, watermark uh, images I showed you before. And I'll show you what happens if I turn off these 30 um, uh, watermark neurons. Um, so I'm gonna give the network the same input, but turn off these neurons during its computation and you can see what the output looks like. So you can see before you know, uh, forcing these neurons off and after forcing these neurons off, um, the images are still very intelligible. They look um, realistic still, uh, but now the watermarks are gone. Um, so I thought I was when I when I saw this, I was pretty excited.
because it's like, oh, there are switches inside the networks. And these networks are doing all sorts of amazing things, not just like showing watermarks. Uh, you know, uh, so when I first found this, it was on Progressive GAN, which is a year earlier, the, 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 or a couple years earlier, the images didn't look quite as good. Um, but, but still in Progressive GAN, they do all sorts of amazing things. Like uh, they will arrange a scene with a river and trees and grass and, you know, building architectures with all sorts of different features. And you can ask, you know, is there a switch to turn on and off clouds in the sky? Is there a switch to turn on and off uh, trees or windows in buildings? And, uh, and so I went hunting for that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the way uh, I went hunting is I tested every neuron one at a time. I inverted the test. So basically, I, I look at each neuron and I say, where is it activating? Um, and, and I ask the question, is it activating in an interesting uh, part of different images? So for example, if I took this one neuron here and I see where it's activating when it's generating this image, you can see it's very hot on the right and on the left, but not much up in the sky. Um, and uh, on this very same neuron, when we generate a different uh, image with a different input, um, this very same neuron is not activating very much anywhere in this, this image. Um, but if we generate another image, then it will activate in a specific area here, mostly on the lower left part of this image. And you can see what's on the lower left. There's a, there's a tree there. And so it kind of gives you the hypothesis that maybe this neuron is, is correlated with trees somehow. So obviously we can, we can do this, um, we can collect this uh, information over thousands of examples of generated images by looking at where the neuron is uh, activating. We can ask what, what kind of thing is in the image? What kind of um, uh, objects? What are the semantics of the image in the location that the, um, the neurons are in? And we can just repeat that test process um, uh, you know, thousands of times uh, to see if the neuron is agreeing with any particular kind of semantics uh, that are in the images. So if, if, the, um, if the neurons are showing up where the trees are all the time, we can just count and see if, uh, if, that's, if that's true in general. Um, and we can also look for correlations with uh, other things. So what I did is I, I searched for correlations with thousands of different, uh, you know, hundreds of different, uh, uh, different types of semantics and object classes, um, different parts of buildings or, or objects or other things that can show up in a scene. And so what do we find? Well, we do find, you know, there's a neuron that correlates with trees, just like the one I was showing you. Uh, there's actually a few uh, that are like that. And there's also neurons that uh, correlate with other things like domes um, or, or other building parts like windows and doors. And, um, and if you change the model to look at other things, then you can find neurons that correlate with things like uh, windows uh, or chairs um, or other things that, that they show up in, in the scene. And so that's, that's actually pretty neat because this model was trained unsupervised by any labels. All, all we did is we told it, generate realistic looking scenes, realistic looking photos. And, um, and, and we did not train it with any labels. We didn't tell it that these are photos of um, uh, scenes that have big windows and these are photos of scenes that have little windows or anything like that, or, 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 or here's where the windows are. Um, but what happened was the network uh, discovered that it had to, you know, learn a representation um, where windows are represented differently from the way chairs are represented. Uh, but somehow, even though, um, uh, you know, windows can look very different from each other and chairs can look very different from each other, the, the network has this represent this this component of this representation, this neuron that activates. Um, on all these chairs, despite the amazing amount of diversity that it shows, like none, none of these chairs um, really look similar to each other. They have different colors and different textures and the, they're oriented in different ways. Uh, and yet uh, the same neuron is activating on, on all of them. The same thing goes for other things that show up uh, in these, these images. So does anybody have any questions about, about, about this? I'd love this to be a little bit more interactive than the way I'm giving the talk. So uh, let me open the floor for a question for a minute. Has anybody tried playing with uh, the internals of uh, GANs yet? I'd love to um, 
see if has anybody like generated images using a, a, a GAN before? Um, no, but I do have a question. Yes. So uh, what was like the end goal or the larger reason behind finding all of these neurons that correspond to different um, objects or features? Well, when I was uh, originally looking at it, my original goal was just to understand how these models did their computation. So asking the question why. Um, but the neat thing is that after um, I found this structure, then it became clear that there are neat applications that you can build on top of it. And I think that's one of the cool things that comes out of this sort of academic style inquiry is, you know, originally I was just looking to make catalogs like this. This is a catalog of all the different types of correlations that I found with neurons inside a model for generating kitchens and the kinds of, you know, the patterns you see. And, um, and, you know, I've done this before for classifiers and, you know, you, when you do it for generators, you get different patterns. And so I, I was just really interested in making these maps of seeing what is computed at what layer, um, you know, where and how accurately. So this is, uh, you know, the, the a progressive GAN has, depending on the resolution, has about 15 layers. And if you sort of chart uh, what you see in different layers, you can see this, this really interesting thing, phenomenon where it's in the middle layers that you get these highly semantic uh, correlated neurons. And, but then as you get to the later layers, then they tend to be more physical and there's not as many uh, semantic objects. So it's like in, in layer five, we have things that really correlate with ovens and chairs and windows and doors, even though like a window kind of looks like an oven, um, the model clearly has different neurons that correlate with windows from ones that look like ovens. Um, and so, uh, so that so that's that's that so I was originally interested in just mapping things out, but um, the correlations were so striking that it leads to these interesting applications that you can build, and I can I'll show you some uh, in the next uh, step. Um, let me before I do that, let me see if anybody else has a question as well. Yeah, David, I was uh, hoping that you could also show us uh, the application at some point, which uh, I think yes. it's, these are very good to see uh, why you asked this question. I mean, yes, it's more intuitive. That's great. Let me let me zoom on to the application. So, um, so the the neat thing is that just like we could turn off watermarks, um, we can turn on and off things in uh, image generation. So, for example, if I find all the neurons that correlate with trees and I turn them off. Uh, you can see what happens. I'm going to turn them off uh, sort of one at a time here. And so uh, originally the image will just be generated like this. But if I turn off some tree neurons, uh, you can see that we can actually remove uh, the trees from the scene. And the cool thing is that this is different from Photoshop. If you went and you tr tried to erase uh, trees from an image, then uh, you'd have this puzzle of what would happen about stuff that was occluded by the trees, like what's going on behind there. And so this image generator is actually, it's got this latent model that uh, has an understanding of what the scene is. And so, um, and it even has an understanding of things that it's not explicitly drawing. So if you remove the trees from the scene, then it'll come up with a reasonable looking, uh, you know, uh, image to draw uh, what was behind the trees. Or you can do the opposite, um, which is you can take neurons that were not originally on in a generated scene and turn them on. So if I take uh, a set of neurons that correlate with doors and I turn them on in a certain location, then you can see what happens in the generated image. You know, I'll get this door in the scene. And not only will it just be a door, but it'll be, it'll have like an appropriate um, size and uh, you know, orientation and style for, for the building that it's in. So if I take exactly the same neurons and I activate them in a different location, like here in this building, uh, then uh, even though it's exactly the same neurons and exactly the same activation uh, that I've done, I get a different door that is like a much smaller, has a different style and so on. It's appropriate to the building that it's in. Um, if I if I try to put a door in a place that wouldn't make sense, like by uh, turning on neurons up in the sky, uh, then it like will it, like not do anything. Um, this is this is the actual output of what happens if I turn on the exact same neurons up in this location. So there's a lot of interesting context sensitivity that you can measure. Um, but one of the cool things that you can do is you can actually hook this up to a, 
uh, a paintbrush uh, user interface. Like I can find neurons that correlate with domes or uh, doors or things. And I, if I want to add doors to a building, I can just sort of paint them on and the doors will show up and you can see the orientation of the doors is appropriate to the wall that you put them in. Uh, if I just say I want trees, it'll put trunks and, and leaves you know, in the right place in the trees, it'll plant, sort of plant, plant them on the ground. If I take grass and I can turn the grass neurons off and remove grass from the scene and it'll come up with what it, the, the scene should look like instead. And so I can kind of do these um, uh, semantic manipulations uh, directly. Oh, here we're turning on domes and you can see it will turn the top of um, uh, the, the, the church uh, from a spire to a dome, but it also sort of stitched the dome into place uh, to make it look good. Here I'm removing grass again. Uh, we can like put a door uh, in the scene, and if I if I um, uh, put you know sort of put a door in the wall, then it'll it'll come up with like the appropriate location and style and orientation for the door, even if I draw very roughly. Um, so when I'm drawing, every time I touch uh, the surface here, what I'm really doing is I'm just turning on a few neurons. Um, and and I'm letting the the math of the GAN generator deal with all of the uh, the details of how to arrange the actual pixel. So does that does that sort of give you a sense? Does that answer your question for like you know what kinds of things you can do with this by understanding what's going on in the interior of the model? Maybe, maybe now I should stop and ask questions. Oh yes, go ahead. Are these different neurons for like doors in different areas? No. No, so when I when you click on the door button on the left, I am picking 20 neurons that are the door, door neurons. So by doing the statistical analysis ahead of time that I showed you earlier, I've identified 20 neurons that correlate very strongly with the presence of doors. And when you click on the button on the left, I am picking those neurons. Now, it's a convolutional network, so there's this translation independence. Those neurons appear at every pixel. Um, and so what you can do is you can just turn on those neurons in random pixels that you touch uh, and see the what the effects that are. you're changing where the neurons are. That was what I didn't understand. Does that make sense? So, yeah, yeah. so because it's a convolutional network, so it's actually, it's, it's like the neural network is cloned at every location. Um, uh, it's the same neural network that's being used to process every, you know, uh, uh, patch or patch of pixels in the image. And, and so if I ask for a door in a place that, wouldn't really make sense, then it won't put a door there. If I ask for a door in a place that makes sense, it'll make a big intervention, it'll stick a big door there, which you can see. So I can be very rough about where I put a door and it'll like put it in the right place. So that's that's the idea. So um, let me let me zoom around here and I'll show you a couple other things that you can do. So um, now there's some limitations to this. And I'll just show you some of the techniques that you can use to get around the limitations. So one of the problems is that, you know, we can do all this cool editing, but we can do this editing of a randomly generated image. And and so uh, so when I posted this demo on on the web, you know, an artist called me and said, hey, you know, I love how you can edit images. I can edit this image of a kitchen here, uh, but that's not the kitchen I want to edit. I want to edit my own kitchen, right? Like here's a photo of my kitchen, and and I want to edit that one. Um, and and I had to explain to them, you know, they, they said, oh, can you just load into your demo my my kitchen instead of yours? And, and I had to explain, no, 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 that's not how GANs work. They are unconditional generators. Uh, you know, you give it a random vector of 512 numbers, and it decides what image to make. <laughs> and then once it decides what image to make, then you can edit it. And so I'm sorry, I can't edit your kitchen. Um, and so they were very disappointed by that because they had all sorts of art ideas of things they wanted to do. And so now the, the problem is that, um, you know, the problem could be solved if we could find the random vector, some random vector that that output the, the kitchen image or the specific real photo that I wanted. Um, uh, the problem is how do I find it? 512 dimensional vectors uh, is pretty big vector space. And um, and so I don't know if my GAN can actually generate this image or not. Uh, so one of the things you can do is you can uh, just treat this as a as an inversion problem. You can take the neural network and you can learn um, how to uh, run it backwards. It basically, you know, the neural, think of the neural network as a function g, 
and you want to learn G inverse. Uh, so you can treat that as another training problem. And there's a bunch of tricks, and I won't go into all the tricks here. But, but basically, the idea is that you can actually find a Z that comes closest to generating your image by, by uh, training and doing a couple other tricks. Um, and you can actually get a Z that will generate your image um, pretty closely. But the, 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 the thing that's a little bit sad is it also reveals things that the network cannot do. So, uh, so this network um, is capable of generating this image that I'm showing you here. But the original kitchen that I started with looked like this. So you can see what the differences are. I've lost a lot of stuff, right? So you know I can use the GAN to edit this image, but uh, this image is not exactly what I started with. And so, um, uh, so one of the pieces of science um, that uh, that I did is I asked the question, um, you know, is there some way that we can actually make this work? Can we actually, you know, get the network to output a real photo that that the user gave us? Well, we can get the network to output this sort of uh, simplified version of it. Um, and it turns out that if I modify the weights of the network. Um, I can actually fine tune the network to get it uh, so that a very, very nearby network with weights that are almost the same as the original um, actually uh, hits this target image uh, exactly. And so, um, so there's a bunch of uh, details in the, in the right way of doing this, but it turns out that you, know, you don't actually have to change much. If you change the fine grained uh, weights of, of a network, you can, you can change a lot of the details of um, uh, what images actually get generated, and uh, and 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 if you are given a target image uh, to get, you can actually tweak tweak any network to generate exactly that target image uh, if we want. And so, um, uh, so you know, um, so yeah, we can get all the, the objects back. But the neat thing is, we haven't really changed the network much, so we can still do editing. So, like if we take the window correlated neurons, we can take our modified network, we can turn them on, and and then now we can like add a window. Uh, let's see if we can show that. Yeah, so this here's Outlook. So we get this nice window here. And the scene is, the GAN is doing its cool tricks of orienting the window properly, you know, doing some reasonable things. And it has some really interesting effects that are uh, non-trivial here. Um, some of them are good and some of them are bad. So for example, all I did was turn on the neurons in this location saying, I want windows. Uh, and it did it. Um, but look what else it did. It also added these reflections right here on the counter, and so this this kitchen GAN does this a lot, like adds adds non-local reflections where it thinks that there's a shiny table. And so the cool thing here is that after I did all the inversion and stuff, this GAN actually thinks that there's a shiny table here, and it's right, and it, it, it thinks that if I add a window here, that it should add a reflection. That's right, also. But look what else happened up here. See this lamp up here? It, when when I first looked at this in low resolution, I thought, oh, maybe it turned off the lamp because once you have windows, you don't need the light on. Uh, but no, it didn't do that. It just messed up the lamp. It's just total. It took this whole area up here, and just, and just distorted it badly. And so, so that that's a little dissatisfying. It means that this fine tuning thing, where we get again to, um, you know, target a specific user image. When I do, when I try to teach it all the details, I'm not really teaching it what the lamp was. I, I was just sort of showing it how to arrange the pixels. And the GAN made its best guess on how to generalize uh, how the image should look differently if I change something like add a window. But with only one example of a lamp that looks like this, it generalized wrong. It has no idea what should happen to that lamp when I when I add a window. So this is this question of like how to make changes uh, in a network uh, with with uh, with achieving good generalization is um, uh, which is 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 a good question, and it was um, it was something that puzzled me. Uh, for a year after doing this work, uh, but but the work is still pretty cool. You can still use it for modifying real photos. So here's like a photo of uh, I, I got out of Wikipedia of like some real locations, um, and you can you can edit them. I can add grass. I can add doors. I can add domes. You know, just like uh, just like the 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 other Gan Paint app, except I can actually start with a real photo that you give me. And I can invert that photo through the network, get a good starting image, fine tune the network to make it um, make it output you know the target image, and then edit that image, uh, add bigger domes, and it'll sort of match the architectural style 
and uh, and and you know do different things like that. I can add domes, remove domes, add doors, you know things like that. Um, let me see if I can get this video here to show. Uh, so this is uh, status center. Let's add some doors here. Um, so you get the idea. I'm doing exactly the same intervention that I did before, uh, and it's a, it's a PNA just like before. It will not add doors in places that it doesn't think are not good places for a door. It has some opinions about where doors are allowed. It likes to put them in brick walls. It thinks it's okay to put a door in a tower, like uh, that architectural detail. Oh, I put domes here. It's happy to put domes on top of buildings. It's not happy to put a dome like in the middle of the sky. Uh, it's not happy to put a door in the middle of the sky, but you know, it'll put trees in different places. Um, and uh, and so there are things that it understands, there are things that it doesn't understand very well. It's sort of making a guess of what the structure of the image is. It doesn't know what to make of my advisor. Uh, you know, it's sort of planting grass in front of him. Uh, and th that's not very realistic, but you can kind of get a feel for what the structure of, and knowledge of the model is by doing these kind of interventions. So this was really cool. I think it got a lot of people's attention. Um, Adobe noticed this stuff and has been busy trying to make uh, Different painting applications uh, using, you know, GAN technology um, that are, I think, partially inspired by 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 this kind of uh, discovery. So, David, I have a question. Yeah. Yep. So this is really cool. Uh, question is, when you uh, modify, for instance, churches, uh, I assume you have trained your GAN on a church data set. Yes. That's correct. What about when you do it uh, on the real images, for instance, in this case, you know, your advisor? Um, yes. What? So actually, both of these are using the church data set as well. So the church oh, data set. Interesting that uh, even you have trained again on church, you can depict a person. Yes. Yeah, so this is so the GAN. Um, now, you have to keep in mind that what I've done here is I've fine tuned the GAN. So you can actually. You know, you can actually get you can actually get a GAN to do a lot of things um, by fine tuning it. Um, so I've I've told the GAN, please basically overfit on this target image. So the GAN, you know, has thirty million parameters, and um, and you know, an image only has you know ten thousand pixels in it. There has plenty of excess capacity to memorize the details that I might want it to do. Um, and so what I've done is this, as I've taken the image, I've asked the GAN through my inversion techniques, what is the closest um, church image that you can generate that looks like my thing? And you, you get a different image. That, I, I don't have the image to show you here, but you get an image that looks kind of more church-like. It's a little, it, it'll, be, it'll, it'll be architectural, it'll have the right kind of shape, the kind of right textures, but you know it won't show my advisor here and things like that. It'll be, it'll be this uh, rough approximation for the, my, my image, but that is in the uh, domain of what the GAN can actually generate, then I say, okay, that's not what I wanna do. I wanna actually edit this photo. So let's fine tune that network so that, um, so that given that same Z, instead of generating the church that you would normally generate, I want you to generate this image. Um, change the weight slightly, get it so that that Z targets this. And um, and so that's what I've done here. But I've tried I've done that in a way where I try not to change the weights too much. I just try to change the weights. I change the fine grained uh, layers, and I don't change the coarse grain layers. And I and I uh, ha have a regularizer to make sure the weights don't change too much. And so um, yep, does it mean that you are changing the pre-trained weights, or you are putting some extra weights and then you place them? Oh, uh, here I'm actually changing. The pre-trained weights. So the network has 15 layers. I'm I'm actually going and I'm changing some of those layers. Um, I'm not adding anything new to the network. I'm just changing the weights in the network itself. Now, now what I've done here is I've overfit the network to this one image. The network is not generalizing this knowledge. So for example, um, you know it can draw Antonio in this one image, but if I look in the network, if I probe it a lot and see, can it ever generate Antonio in a different setting in a different image? Um, it cannot. Uh, in fact, um, you know, as much as we probe things, it really doesn't look like we've changed the output of the network 
in any meaningful way for any image except for this one. It's, it's almost like, you know, the network generates this really complicated manifold of realistic images. And we've told, we've picked up one point of the manifold and we've dragged it over to pass through this point, but we've done it in a very local way. So it's really not affected any other points of what the GAN is generating. Um, and so, uh, so, but, but for the purposes of doing this kind of application, it doesn't matter that it's not generalizing because the user doesn't care about a different photo. They just care about their own photo. So it's a pretty cool, um, it's a pretty cool technique anyway, uh, even though it's sort of not uh, the classical goal of machine learning. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I wonder if uh, the user has more images of themselves with that over time and make the network even better in generation? Yes, this is the big question. And I, I played with this for many months and I haven't gotten it to work. And if anybody can figure out how to get it to work, I feel like it's one of the holy grails of like how to add a new thing to a generator. So like the generator knows about all these things. It knows about trees and knows about all these architectural pieces, you know. Um, but what if I came along with something new? What if I was, um, uh, what if my, what if I, what if I work for GM and I want to sell Cadillacs, then I, then I might come to one of these models and say, you know what, you should draw cars. In fact, I want you to draw specific cars. I want you to draw Cadillacs in front of all these uh, buildings. How, how would I add Cadillacs uh, to my model or add Antonio to my model or something like that? Um, and we don't know how to do that yet. Although I'm going to show you a little bit of work where we can do um, something that's very similar. And if, I don't know if I have time to, to go over this, but I'm going to, I'm going to, zoom through this because I'm so excited by this work. So so um so the it, it's motivated by this uh this sort of question which is uh you know we have a model of like drawing towers let's say right um but there are things in the world that we might want to model that we don't have a data set for. For example, uh you know in uh in, in Decatur County, Illinois there's this courthouse that has a tree growing out at the top of the tower. It started growing out there by accident but the People in the town love it, and so. But it's but there's no so like if I want to get a generative model to draw trees growing out of tops of towers, um, I can't do that in the classical way because I can't create a big data set of a million buildings that have trees growing out of the top of the towers because they don't exist. There's just this one, and so um, now if if the point is I want to generate images of of this type, um, you know well. I could use a regular image editor. I can take any building of a tower, and I, of course, I can stick a tree on it, right? I could use my, you know, GAN painting method to, uh, you know, activate tree neurons or something like that. But no, 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 that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking this other question of like, how can we stick tree towers into my model? How do I modify the model to have this new concept in it? Like, I start with this model that has all these weights that encode all these rules for how buildings look and things like that. And I want to create a new model that has new weights that encode new rules. So for example, the old model could generate all these buildings that, of towers that look normal, have spires, you know, pointy tops. And I want to make a new model that has weights that encode a different rule so that like they have trees growing out the top, right? Or there, any rule that I choose, right? And it turns out that this is actually possible. So this is different from the te technique that I showed you before because in this technique, it's actually generalizing. This is, you know, with, if you use this technique, not only do you change the output of one image of the GAN to have like some effect, but we can actually change um, the outputs for a whole class of, you know, a, a large subset of the outputs of the GANs to follow a different rule. Um, like any pointy tower output will have trees instead of pointy towers. And so, uh, so I'll just show you a little bit of like the interaction here of, of what it looks like when you get our method um, uh, into an application. So I, uh, let's see if I can get this to work. So here, what I'm showing you is uh, the output of a StyleGAN v2 uh, uh, generating churches. Uh, you can kind of, um, and there are three parts of this UI. There's an image viewer. Then what you do is you can select a rule that you want to change and then you can specify how you want to change the rule. So. There's three parts of this little user interface. And I'll just show you sort of how how the effect looks uh, by showing you one of the interactions. So you can set, kind of use the image viewer to scroll through lots of examples of um, 
of what the, uh, the, the generator is capable of generating. And then we can go to these examples and we can say, hey, you know what I'm really interested in? Um, I'm interested in this rule of how to generate pointy towers. And so I can select a few pointy towers. And you can think of this as what I'm looking for is the neurons that are responsible for the shape. And so I can select a few examples and I can say, hey, what other, um, what other outputs of the GAN share the same representation? And, uh, and it'll show me, oh yes, the GAN is generalizing this way. These other pointy towers are represented the same way as the ones that you chose. And then I can go and I can say, all right, I wanna redefine how um, these uh, pointy towers are rendered uh, by this generator. I, I want them to be rendered like this tree here. So I can copy the tree from one output of the generator and I can paste it into where I would like that tree to show up. Um, I want it to show up instead of pointy towers. And uh, then I can say, okay, now insert this new rule into the model. May, you know, compute what the right change is to change the model. And then after I do that, uh, that takes about eight seconds to do the math uh, to figure out how to change a rule. And then after I do that, then uh, I get the GAN to generate uh, new images and um, and they look like this, you know, like the tops of the towers now have trees on them instead. So you can see how that looks. And it's not just affecting that one image, it's affecting all the pointy tower uh, images. Um, I can do a little search for more pointy tower images and and uh, do I have that here in my thing? Yeah, so here's a search for more pointy tower images. And you can see they, you know, they, they all have gotten uh, these trees sprouting out the top of it, like some sort of uh, dystopian uh, tree world where vegetation is taking over the planet. And um, and so so you can do this in a bunch of things. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over uh, some of the technical things here, or some of the other examples of what you can do here. You, um, you can edit reflections and things like that. Uh, I've got other videos that you can look for on the internet. But I want to just show you a sense for what we're doing inside when we do this kind of thing. So like I showed you before, that uh, GAN has is like got all these convolutional layers uh, stacked up. It's about 15 layers. And what 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 the discovery was that led to this application was that each one of those layers can be thought of as solving a very simple separate problem from the other layers. And what is that simple problem? It, it can be treated like a memory where the layer is solving this problem of matching key value pairs that it's memorized. So every location has a feature vector that you can think of as a key and what and and the key each key like you know represents a certain type of context like you know the middles of towers or the tops of towers or something like that, and what you can think of um, the uh, the the map as 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 storing is what should be uh, what is like the pattern of features that should be rendered whenever that context comes up, right? So you can think of it as just basically key value store, and um, and so. Uh, so this whole idea of using a matrix as a key value stores, and it's like the oldest idea uh, in neural networks. Uh, people observed back in the 1970s that if you have a single layer neural network, you can um, uh, treat it as, a, as an approximate key value store that uh, remembers keys with minimal error. Um, and, uh, and so if you had a set of keys and a set of values that you want to store, and you ask, what is the optimal single layer neural network that you'd use to store it, it's actually, uh, you know, classical linear algebra, it's like the solution to a least squares problem. So what we can hypothesize is that in these very, very fancy, you know, 2020, you know, uh, 50 years later, uh, deep neural networks, actually each layer is just acting as one of these. Now, which keys are being stored and what values were st being stored, we don't know. But we could hypothesize that there is some set of things that are being memorized, some set of keys and values. Um, and so that that maybe this weight matrix that we have is a solution to some of these squares problem. So the cool thing that we can do is we can say, we can ask the question, what would the weight matrix look like if we changed one of the rules? What if we had one new key value pair that we wanted to change? Then what would the weight matrix be instead? We want all the other things that the network has memorized to still be memorized with minimal error, just as before, except we we're gonna give this new constraint. We wanna write a new key value pair into it. 
And it turns out that that's also a least squares problem. It's a constrained least squares problem. We can write down the solution in this form. And the cool thing about these two least squares problems is that they cancel each other out. Most of the terms are the same. And, and, uh, and we can actually ask the question, um, how would the weights have to change if we added a new key value pair without knowing which values were written into the network before? We don't actually have to know uh, what the old key value pairs were. We can just assume that um, the network was optimal as, as storing all these key value pairs. And, um, and the math for like how to write a new uh, key value pair comes out the same anyway. So, so that's, there's, there's a little bit of a mathematical um, uh, insight and trick here, but what it allows us to do is it allows us um, to find exactly what we need to do to, to change one thing that the network has memorized. You do this rank one update in a specific direction and, um, and you can take a key and change it to any value you want. Um, and that will, you know, this, the same form will minimize error um, uh, for, for other keys, regardless of what value we write. It's almost like it really is uh, a form of memory uh, that we're changing. So our method is basically you find uh, a key by asking the user to select a few contexts that look the same. We average them to get a good key. Then we ask for a copy paste example to get a goal. Uh, that's the new value that we want to write into the key of the memory. And then we do this math um, to, uh, to find how to change W in the direction of the key only. We find a, a rank one update uh, that does this. And so, um, and so that avoids changing other rules. So we can do this on a bunch of different GAN models. And, and so you can see like, uh, you know, people like to change uh, um, people's expressions uh, here, so what we're doing is a little different from what you normally do to change people's expressions in a GAN. What we're doing is we're actually going to rewrite the GAN so it only outputs people who are smiling. We're going to take all the frowns and we're saying, okay, there's there's a rule for frowns. We're going to change that to a rule for smiles by showing an example. And so by patching frowns to smiles, now we have a model that just outputs people who are smiling. Uh, we live in a happy world. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty cool. And now, of course, we could have done that by you know, you changing the training set um, by collecting only uh, training data of people who are smiling. But the neat thing is that you can also do this for uh, things where the, you don't have a training set that looks like it. So for example, there's a, there's a rule in the model for how eyebrows should look uh, on kids. So you can see that kids have these very wispy light uh, eyebrows that don't have much hair. So we can find that rule by identifying a few examples that gives us a rank one direction in the weight matrix and then we can redefine it. We can write a new uh, thing into it and say, you know what? We want the eyebrows to look like this, like this very bushy mustache. And uh, you know, we'll paste it into one example, do the math. And then now we can change the weights in a way that generalizes. So now all the kids have these very bushy um, you know, eyebrows. And it's something that we wouldn't have been able to get by collecting a training set because we don't have kids that look like this in the real world. Uh, it's something that just comes out of our imagination. So this is kind of the thing. I, I kind of feel like this is the big reason why. why. Why be interested in how these models are working inside? And the reason to be so interested in it is because as long as we don't look inside our models, then we're really constrained. Because the only thing that our models can really do is imitate the real world. We can collect huge amounts of data and the models that we create will just get better and better at imitating the way that the data is, the way the world is today. And I kind of feel like it goes a little bit against why I was interested in computer science years ago when I entered it in the first place. Because the amazing thing about computer science is that you can use it to create algorithms that represent things in the world that don't exist yet, things that you can only imagine. And so machine learning is sort of on this path right now where we're getting very, very good at replicating the way the world is. And we're going to be confronted with this question of how do we use these techniques to actually create new worlds that don't exist yet that are the way that we want them to be. And I think that um, this is really gonna require us to not just get models that are you know, just really good at imitating but also models that are understandable to people so that we can change the rules inside um, and, uh, and, and then use them to create things that, uh, that are based on our imagination instead of, uh, instead of uh, just, just the training data. And so, uh, so here's, here's a fun thing here. I think uh, if I want to be fair, 
to the horses, uh, you notice that none of the horses in this horse generating GAN get to wear hats, even though all the people get to wear hats. So we can change that by taking a hat from a person and inserting it into our GANS model of what a horse's head should look like. And then now horses get to wear hats, right? And so, so let's build a better world um, and, uh, and allow uh, people to change the rules of the world by making the rules more visible and, um, and manipulatable by humans. That's, that's sort of the goal of, of the whole thing. So uh, any, any questions? Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Does would this method work with multiple different models, or is it only successful when like taking a hat from within this model and putting on a horn? So right now, this this uh, method is only able to take uh, it. It's um it's only able to rewire one model. So I can take one part of a model and rewire it uh, to a different model. You're sort of asking the transplant question. So I'm sort of at the point where, you know, uh, it's, it's like a surgeon. I can like connect one blood vessel to another blood vessel in the same human, right? And you're sort of asking the question, well, can I do a heart transplant? Can I take a heart out of one person and put in another one? And I cannot do that yet. It it turns out to be harder. Um, and um, uh, but I but it's it is a it is uh, an obvious goal. And I and I feel confident that if we understand uh, well enough all the things that make these computations work what is needed for the care and feeding of a computational module? What is a computational module inside a big learn system? Uh, then we should, you know, it should be a goal to be able to move a piece of computation from one neural network to another one. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yep. That's a really great question, by the way. I think it's, uh, I think it's fundamental. Any other questions? Uh, this is not too well articulated question, okay. but I'm, um, I, I was just curious what you what your what are your thoughts about this? Um, I think this is this like neural nets have tendency to like avoid the responsibility of the results. Like everything is done in the hidden layers and sort of shrug off shrug off the responsibility about the results. And I I, I thought it was like interesting how you set the objective towards something as abstract as um, realistic. And here, like how you define the concept of being realistic is based on the big data you collected from the web, but, but oftentimes some like fake images sometimes look even more realistic than real images. And I don't know, like tree growing on top of the building may look fairly realistic for some people, but maybe for plant experts, maybe it would not. Right. So I don't know, like, I think right. this might result in like the blurring between the, it making us hard to distinguish between the real and the fake or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I think that there are, so, um, so the, we're, we're unaccustomed to making it easy for making programs that make such realistic renderings of the world, and it's actually a concern. Um, I think that uh, you know people have misused this technology already. That we you know we use we you know there's the whole deep fakes phenomenon. But even um, without like faking videos, uh, people people have um, uh, you know used uh, face generators to make lots of fake uh, Facebook profiles and things like that. You know, pre pretending there are millions of people that exist that don't actually exist. Um, and things like that. So, uh, so even before you sort of do manipulations of the world, I think that there's already this problem of of um, of you know pretending that there's a, a lot of data that there actually isn't by using these generator models. And so I think that there's um, uh, you know the whole the whole question of fakes is a very serious um, uh, question like how do we how do we uh, function society if we don't know what's real and what's fake um, now it's it's not a totally new issue uh, you don't need uh, a state-of-the-art uh, deep learning model to make uh, fake you know people have made fake photoshops uh, by hand forever people write can write text that has all sorts of lies 
uh, forever. Uh, in fact, that's probably more effective than um, you know trying to train a deep learning model and you know sort of make it work. Uh, but I think it's I think it's a you know it's still an important question because the easier we make it to make fakes, you start to get issues like a scalable fakes where it's not just one uh, one photo that is a lie or one article that's a lie. You could generate millions. Um, and I think that there are serious issues with that. So there's some pretty interesting work in forensics for uh, detecting fakes and, and things like that um, that I think is important to invest in as well as, as, we, as we advance uh, the state of the art and this kind of thing. So I, so, so I don't want to minimize um, uh, you know, the implications of this type of thing. I think that for the type of work that I'm doing, I think that you observed that the tree kind of looks realistic. It's not super realistic, uh, you know. If you're a plant expert, it's just sort of, a, um, you know, sort of there. Uh, I think the same thing with hats. They don't really super look like hats. And so I think that we're we're sort of at the stage where uh, the really exciting work, uh, the implication of what I've done here, I think, is um, the idea that the you know learning how these models are working inside. Uh, by understanding what the internal structure of the models is, is really the 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 uh, the exciting part that, uh, that it's starting to give a little insight on um, how we might untangle and disassemble what the internal logic is uh, that is being learned by these these deep networks. And um, and I'm actually I I feel like this is I feel like there's a different issue other than fakes, which is actually um, has some ethical implications which is transparency of deep networks. Uh, because one thing that they're not really good at doing is when you um, have a deep network do something amazing, they're really not good at answering the question, why? Why did you do that? Why did you choose to render it this way? Why did you choose uh, to pick these objects to put in the scene? Or why did you choose to deny me some credit or to you know, to make some other decision that we were at, you know, you know, uh, depending on neural networks to do? And I think that if we can understand uh, how to disassemble the rules that are being applied inside the network for it to make its decision, then I think that we'll we'll be we'll have a way of asking why, um, and uh, by looking at the computation directly. So that's my that's one of my goals and one of my hopes in doing this kind of work. Yeah, definitely. I, I can I can see some diverse um, a view about like um, about. The transparency of the neural network, especially when you uh, when you show the example where you detected a, a single neuron that contributes to the watermark thing. Yes, I think that, that was like it was really interesting. Yep. Yeah, I think so too. I was surprised that it worked because we normally think of neural networks as very, very, very opaque. I, I also have a, a small question regarding. Um, artifacts. So I think in the, in the beginning, you talked about how you segmented the network with like masks that were classified before um, by mapping neurons in beginning layers, which create things. Um, but could like, can that be also used to figure out where artifacts or anomalies are generated to make GANs better? Yeah, actually, um... I, I don't have a picture of it here, but in um, in my work where I was looking for neurons, originally uh, it's called this, the paper is called GAN dissection. You can you can Google it for it, and um, and and I and I I show that in that paper we analyze uh, some of the pre-trained GANs that came from a previous uh, work um, uh, from NVIDIA uh, called Progressive GAN. We analyzed some of the pre-trained models, and we found that they actually are neurons that correlate with bad looking artifacts in a scene. And if you turn those neurons off, you can actually not only improve the quality of the output of the GAN, uh, just qualitatively, like you, know, you can get these artifacts to, to not show up, but like, using standard measures of um, GAN, you know, statistical measures of GAN image fidelity at large scale, uh, by removing these neurons, you can actually improve the, what we call the FID scores of these GANs when, when tested on like 50,000 images. And so, um, so that's actually very weird to me. That's it's, it was a big surprise um, because because uh, we we train these things using you know powerful optimization techniques, using uh, you know 
billions of floating point operations, you know, training these things on big expensive GPUs for a long period of time. And the idea that a human can come along and do a simple looking visualization, pick out a few neurons based on things that don't look good um, and improve the model by turning those neurons off uh, it was uh, it, it, like, it shouldn't be possible, right? If, if it was so easy to improve the model that way, why couldn't the optimizer uh, find it? And so, um, so I think that was that was that was uh, pretty interesting. Um, I um, I have not repeated that experiment on the latest GANs, which are actually much better. The style GANs um, to architecture, they they went back and they analyzed a bunch of the artifacts that show up in uh, in this this family of GANs, and they 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 found that there are certain learning methods that they can do to remove the artifacts or reduce them uh, somewhat. And so I don't know if a human can still beat um, the the current generation of GANs. It'd be worth uh, going back and, and seeing if that phenomenon is still there. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Yep. OK, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, it was really fascinating topic uh, and talk and more interesting to me. Uh, asking the right questions asking questions and learning to ask the right questions it's really interesting and i think that it opened path to many of us excellent hey thank you for the opportunity to talk to the group here today i always uh uh enjoy the uh the chance to uh to interact with folks about this if anybody wants to send other questions about it of course you can always send me a note um uh and uh, uh, you know, I love this stuff. Yeah, definitely. I think that it would be great to uh, follow um, your work on your GitHub and your website, and especially for a student to play with the tools that you have, so they have them get an understanding of how these tools work and make them more curious about the work. Cool. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye now.